Welcome back to Generals and Napoleon, episode 85, King Jerome Bonaparte of Westphalia, Napoleon's youngest brother. Before we begin, I'd like to remind all of our listeners that if you'd like to support our podcast, please go to patreon.com forward slash generals and Napoleon. There you'll find three options. We have a $2.50 a month option, a $5 a month option, and a $10 a month option for donations and contributions. We very much appreciate all support. As always, thank you for listening. And now on with the show. Another great episode, another great guest. We have the great legendary Graham Callister on the line once again. Hello, Graham. Hello. How are you? Good, good. I'm working on my intros. I, I keep, I'm trying to find superlatives for you, but uh, I, <laughs> there just aren't enough that really sum you up. So hopefully that's okay. Hey, far too kind. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't know Graham, he's been on our show before. Um, really brilliant author. And he has a new book coming out. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that book? Yeah, it's, it's on the Battle of Waterloo called Waterloo, the Attack of First Corps. Uh, that's the, the French First Corps under Derlon. And it's about this attack of Derlon's Corps at the start of the Battle of Waterloo, um, which is is a somewhat overlooked episode. You know, it, it doesn't have the glory of uh, the, the old guard or the cavalry charges or Hougoumont, uh, but it's a really important episode of the battle. And I go into to quite granular detail about what happens, what the forces are, who is there, um, some some interesting revelations I like to think in the book. Uh, so do check it out if you're interested in the Battle of Waterloo. Yeah, I don't think people understand how close Derlan was to breaking through or how he kind of rallied his broken core and kind of basically caught La Haye Saint, correct? Yeah, yeah. It's um like I said, uh, you know, it's an understudied part of the battle, but also people often overlook how close this was to, to victory. It's one of the two, maybe three moments in the battle where Napoleon could have won it. Um, there is a moment where there are no more reserves for the Allies beyond the cavalry, um, and you know, had the French broken through there, uh, Wellington's line would have been pretty much compromised. So it's a, it is a really important moment in the battle. And as you say, Derlon actually does well to rally his broken corps and come again later in the fight. Mm -hmm. And Marshal Ney, he did okay. So I, yeah. I, I just like to throw that in there wherever I can. Yeah, yeah. There's there's not much disgrace on Marshall now on this one. All right. Um, now, <laughs> the guy we're speaking to today, Jerome Bonaparte, I would say it was the anti Marshall Ney who did not really cover himself in glory very often. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. <laughs> so, for those of uh, my listeners who don't know, Jerome was uh, the youngest member of the Bonaparte family. I was born in Corsica in 1784, November. Um, but his upbringing is a lot different than Napoleon's and Joseph's, correct? Yeah, he doesn't have the same kind of going off to France to school. Um, he doesn't have the same penury. You know, the, the first 10 years of his life, the family isn't particularly well off. Uh, it's tumultuous times. His father dies when he's, he's very young. Uh, you know, he's only about a year of age. Um, Joseph takes over the running of the family. So the, the first 10 years of his life are, are pretty tumultuous. But then from the age of 10, he's pretty much the spoiled younger brother of greater men. Uh, his teen years are spent in relative luxury with the added excitement of holidays in Italy with his brother's army. He was far enough from any danger, uh, but near enough to the excitement to get a taste for things. Um, Napoleon and later Josephine both spoil him absolutely rotten. Um, there's a, a great story just after Napoleon becomes first consul. Uh, Jerome starts to go off on, on really whimsical shopping sprees in Paris and <laughs> orders that the bill be sent to the Tuileries because uh, his brother will pay it. Uh, you know, so th it's clearly some kind of teenage power trip. And, and Napoleon's always very indulgent and pays these bills. Um, so Jerome grows up as a, a spoiled younger brother in uh, a life of, of relative luxury and wealth, certainly during his teenage years. Yeah, it's interesting. It's almost like the first 10 years, you know, it's almost like a rootless existence where they have almost no money. And it's almost like they hit the lottery ticket with Napoleon. And all of a sudden, he has all this money to spend wherever he wants. Yeah. And from, you know, 1794, the, they're no longer really um, living hand to mouth. Uh, he's got uh, cash. He's got houses, the servants. 
Uh, and I, I think Jerome gets somewhat spoiled by all of this. Um, you know, his mother will have kept him quite grounded. She remained grounded even when her, her sons were, or sons and daughters were monarchs uh, and were ruling the continent. Um, so I think his mother will have kept him in check a bit, but, you know, Jerome comes across really as, you know, the, the spoiled rich brat, uh, I've got to be honest, during his teenage years. Well, um, he does study a little bit in Paris, correct? Yeah, yeah, he does. Uh, you know, Napoleon tries to ensure he gets an education. Um, Joseph as well takes an interest. They do try to make sure that he can go somewhere in life. Um, but, you know, it's it's hard being the uh, the younger brother of such famous men, I'm sure, to, to focus on your studies. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and then in 1800, he embarks on a career in the French Navy, which I think is interesting that he didn't follow his older brother, Napoleon and Louis' footsteps in the army. Yeah, I mean, he does um, actually take a, an honorary commission very briefly uh, in the Chasseurs, the Cheval of the Consular Guard, um, but it's mostly this honorary position, and it fades away after Jerome Swaggering gets him embroiled in a duel. Um, unfortunately, it's a duel with a cousin of the future Marshal de Vaux as well, which doesn't help their relationship. Uh, and Jerome actually gets shot in this duel, but he's, he's not particularly badly wounded. Mm. Um, but And I know Napoleon hated dueling, so that probably couldn't have made him happy. Yeah, this is and this is definitely Jerome being a you know the, the really arrogant young teenager. Uh, you know he's only sixteen years of age, uh, and so no, no, Napoleon realizes that he he needs to to give Jerome a, a task, um, and so you know no, Napoleon decides on the navy, and I, I suspect this is because he'd already earmarked Louis to be his follower in the army. Mm. Uh, Louis is kind of the mini me for Napoleon there. Um, and he still at this stage has faith that Louis is, is going to come good. So he gives Jerome a naval career as a way of letting him carve out his own niche, perhaps. And he also has an eye on Jerome developing eventually into being the high admiral of France, uh, the leader of France's fleets. Um, so it, it is slightly unusual, but it is typical of Napoleon to try to position family members in every high position in France. And at this stage, Napoleon is, of course, also enough of a pragmatist um, to believe that they should at least have some passing familiarity with their role. Um, so I think he's trying to give Jerome some kind of career. He's trying to give him a purpose with the promise of high reward in his own niche later to come. Well, um, how does he fare in the Navy? It seems his only memorable act was almost touching off a war with the British. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see Jerome as a particularly good naval officer. Um, he starts off mildly enthusiastic. His first year is pretty uneventful. He joins a squadron in the Mediterranean as a young officer aboard the flagship. Uh, he spends about eight months cruising around. Um, he sees one small action, nothing particularly spectacular. Um, and Jerome seems to have applied himself well enough to, to studying his role. Um, he's probably overindulged by the other officers. He's probably not given as many duties as he would have done as a, a normal midshipman. Um, but he does seem to have applied himself a bit. But then he comes back to Paris, um, you know, at the age of 17. Um, and he's treated as a conquering hero, despite having done you know, pretty much nothing at all. And it, it seems to have gone to his head. And at the, you know, this grand old age of 17, he thinks himself a veteran and an expert on naval affairs. He starts to lecture Napoleon and lecture Napoleon's ministers about what they should do with the Navy. And uh, at the, the end of 1800, or end of 1801, sorry, Napoleon gets a bit bored of this and, and orders him sent to a squadron to be sent to the West Indies. Mm. He spends a couple of months there and then has himself sent back to France with dispatches, um, thinking that he'll get a promotion from this. Uh, Napoleon's not particularly impressed and tries to send him back to the West Indies. Uh, but Jerome you know, dallies for about six months in France. So I think we can already see that he's not thinking seriously in terms of actual service as a naval officer. Right. He does eventually go back to the West Indies. He's given command of a small corvette. And he spends about a year cruising around the Mediterranean, uh, sorry, uh, cruising around the Caribbean, mm. um, visiting just about every island he can confined uh, having a great jaunt uh, this is during the peace of amiens you know britain france at peace hoping that this will stretch for a few years um and so jerome decides during this period of peace uh, that he's going to uh to start swaggering about and start shooting at some british ships in the caribbean <laughs> without napoleon's permission yeah without napoleon's permission without any permission from any local officers um and he he fires on a british naval or a British merchant ship who who then 
shout back to him and say, look, we're, we're British and we're at peace. You shouldn't be firing at us. Um, and he, he does then cease fire. Uh, and when the report of this reaches his admiral, the admiral is furious with Jerome and says, no, even a, a moderate sailor should have realized that this ship was flying a British flag. You don't fire at it. And, and he orders Jerome back to France and says, go and speak to your brother before anyone else tells him the news. Get your side in first. You, you might be able to get away with this. Um, but Jerome refuses and says, no, I, I have a different opinion of this. I did nothing wrong. Uh, he dithers around in the Caribbean. Uh, he, th he decides he's going to take a pleasure cruise up to the United States. Um, so having nearly started a war with Britain, he kind of doesn't care. He, he yeah. just carries on sailing around. Um, so I don't think he's a very good naval officer. I don't think he's in it for the service. And he shows at this stage that he really isn't going to be taking orders from anyone just because they happen to be an admiral when he is the brother of the first consul. Yeah, and that'll come back up later in the invasion of Russia, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, so somewhat pleasure boating, somewhat fearing Napoleon's wrath, he kind of leaves the United States or does he just want to hang out in the United States and party there? Like, Other than running up huge debts there, what's he doing there? I think he, he's got this idea that he wants to sail around and, and see things, but also I suspect he's, he's trying to put off this meeting with, with Napoleon that he'd have to have if he gets back to France. Um, so he does sail up to the United States in a, um, a merchant vessel, um, and he basically acts like the, the spoiled kid that he's become. Um, you know, he's, he's now about 20 years of age. Um, for years now, he's thought of himself as a bit of a celebrity because of his family connections. He's got wealth or the at least the ability to borrow money. He's got glamour. He's got position. Um, and he pretty much just ends up living the high life, uh, you know, in high society across the United States, uh, wherever he goes, he's fated. He's a, a person of interest. Um, and he, he just parties. He spends a lot of other people's money. Uh, he ignores all orders from all French officers and the French ambassador to, to go back to France. Um, when they, they send him direct orders, he just writes back and says, I have a different interpretation of this. Um, so, you know, he, he's having a great time and he's he's not willing at this stage to get back to France. It's interesting, though, like you think even a 20 year old would realize it's not my glittering personality that's getting me all this publicity. It's my brother and his efforts. But it seems like Jerome never understood that. No, he, he does seem to think that he's a bit of a hero. But you know, Napoleon maybe brings this on as well. When Jerome returns from his first cruise around the Mediterranean, you know, when he's 17, he is welcomed back to Paris like a conquering hero. When he comes back from the Caribbean with dispatches uh, that time, he's welcomed back to Paris as if he's some kind of conquering hero. Again, people are writing poems about him being the great sailor, about how the, the men of the fleet look up to him. So, you know, his head is turned by all this nonsense as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I think he should have been a bit more sensible, but um, I imagine in that position, it's it's very easy to start to believe your own hype. Yeah. Um, and while he's in the United States, he marries Elizabeth Patterson. Uh, can you tell us a bit about her and then Napoleon's reaction to this news? Uh, she's the, the daughter of a, a well-to-do man from Baltimore. Uh, the family is perfectly respectable. Um, she is a, a renowned beauty. She's about the same age as Jerome. I think there's two or three months difference. Uh, she's well-educated. She's refined. She speaks French, which helps because Jerome doesn't really speak much English. Um, and so when they meet, they really hit it off. And Jerome becomes a bit infatuated with her and decides he wants to marry her. Um, they, they get engaged. Um, Jerome... Um, tells the French ambassador this and the French ambassador says, no, you need to stop this. You know, he, your brother will hit the roof when he hears. Um, right. So Jerome kind of you know, swears him to silence. There's a, a brief period where they, they pretend to break off the engagement, but then he goes and marries her uh, in late 1803, pretty much, uh, you know, in secret. Um, he gets the, the Catholic archbishop, uh, I can't remember of where, maybe Baltimore to, to kind of conduct the marriage. Um, so this is, uh, you know, sanctified by a high religious office. So it's and, not like like Lucian's where he kind of got married in secret. This is pretty well known what's going on here. Yeah, it's, it's well known certainly in America. And he, he tries to make it as official as possible because he's got a real problem. And the problem is that he's only 20 years old. And under French law, no one can marry without their parents' permission under the age of 21. And that law also states they can't marry abroad. 
under the mm. age of 21 without a parent's permission. So his marriage is actually illegal. Uh, and he persuades the father of Elizabeth Patterson that his brother and mother will accept this uh, marriage when he tells them about it. Um, you know, he, he promises it'll all be fine, but actually um, he's not in a legal position to get married. So I think he tries to overcompensate and get the, the highest possible figure he can to, to conduct the ceremony. Um, but when Napoleon hears about this, uh, to say he's furious is probably an understatement. Um, <laughs> Because he, he thinks it shows a few things. One, it shows that Jerome disrespects him. He didn't even bother asking for permission. Mm -hmm. So it shows he disrespects the law of France, which at this stage for Napoleon uh, is, is almost as important. You know, he's trying to have this idea of legitimacy and, and legality. Um, it shows that uh, Jerome is foolish. It shows that he is disobeying orders uh, from senior officers, from the French ambassador. So it shows in so many ways for Napoleon that Jerome has acted foolishly. Um, and he is enraged. Uh, he says the the, um, the marriage has no legal grounds. He says it, it can be annulled immediately. Um, he insists that Jerome comes home on his own and says that if Jerome tries to bring his wife back, uh, she will be banned from entering any French ports and immediately deported if she sets foot on French soil. So Napoleon is is absolutely furious with this entire arrangement. Yeah, it's interesting to me. Like Napoleon was not in the business of promoting fools, and this should have been a warning sign, many warning signs. And just you know what, give Jerome a country estate, give him money, but just put him off on the country and, and not give him anything. But Napoleon goes the other route and is like, all right, I'm going to give him all these titles and awards and stuff it it seems like napoleon's as much his fault like you were saying as jerome for all this yeah i think napoleon always hoped that this was just youthful hijinks that this was just youthful exuberance and, and jerome would come to his senses and if you just gave him more responsibility he'd grow into the responsibility mm. um i guess with some men that does work um you know there are some people who who have a a misspent youth but then they're given a, a role and they really mature in it. Uh, and maybe Napoleon hoped that for Jerome, but it, it doesn't really happen, alas. And the tragic comedy of errors that continue with Jerome, he and his pregnant bride attempt to re-enter Europe. How does this go? Oh, well, uh, as you can imagine, it doesn't go too well. Um, <laughs> so firstly, Jerome is ordered to, to return to France on a French frigate. He refuses because he thinks that now they're at war with Britain again, the frigate will be intercepted, and he fears capture. Um, and then he contracts to go on a ship uh, that gets wrecked. I think it's in, in Chesapeake Bay still. Um, so, you know, he, he has to land again, loses most of his possessions. And finally, he takes a trading ship with his wife off to Lisbon. Um, but by then, Napoleon's declared their marriage illegal. He's made it clear to all French ambassadors and consuls across Europe that they should refuse Jerome's wife permission to enter France. So when they arrive in Lisbon, Jerome is told, you know, you can proceed on your own, but you have to leave your wife here. Eventually, mm. Jerome decides to go to Italy, where Napoleon is at that stage, uh, to plead his case. And he sends his wife Elizabeth off to Amsterdam, thinking that she can land in Amsterdam and he can go and get her later. But of course, Amsterdam is in the Netherlands, controlled by the French, and they refuse her permission to land as well. And so the ship ends up taking her to England. Um, where she's actually treated as a bit of a celebrity because you know there's a real interest in Jerome's wife. And when Napoleon hears that she's being treated as a celebrity, he assumes that she's kind of defected to Britain. Uh, and so that turns him against him even more. When he meets Jerome, he says to Jerome, uh, you know, you either do what I tell you or I will court martial you. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely wow. fed up with you. Because um, yeah. Jerome's been disobeying orders from senior naval officers for years as well. Um, right. So Jerome is you know, threatened by Napoleon. And Jerome doesn't have either the moral courage or, or quite frankly, the intelligence um, to really play the game with Napoleon. And he ends up being browbeaten, essentially, into giving up his wife and child. Uh, for a while, he continues to write to Elizabeth Patterson saying, no, you are still my wife. I'll talk my brother around, just wait for a few months. Um, but in the end, uh, you know, he is persuaded by Napoleon or, or bullied by Napoleon into... Uh, accepting that that marriage has been annulled uh, into never seeing them or not seeing them again, at least uh, while Napoleon was in charge. Yeah, it's it's kind of tragic in a way. That, you know, Jerome's baby ends up being born in England and he doesn't see his son for two decades. So that part's quite sad. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, it seems that this was a genuine attachment that, that Jerome had to Elizabeth Patterson. Um, you know, it was a real love match, and he genuinely um, regretted having to give her up. But on the other hand, I think Napoleon dangled wealth, riches, power in front of him, and he chose that, unlike Lucien, who, uh, who chose his wife over Napoleon. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, in return for ending his marriage as ordered, Napoleon makes him a general in the army and also makes him king of the new territory of Westphalia, which in our Napoleonic story, you know, Napoleon ends the Holy Roman Empire and kind of Jerry rigs or Jay Manders this new, basically, country. What territories make up this Westphalia? So it's pretty much in northwest Germany. Um, territories will include Hesse, bits of former Hanover, uh, bits of Prussian territory of Magdeburg and Brunswick. Uh, its capital is around Cassel, if people know where that is, but, but northwest Germany, essentially. Okay. Uh, he takes a new bride, Princess Katerina of Württemberg, and they make, like you said, the capital in the city of Cassel. Uh, how does he do as king? Cause it, it's interesting that Louis was made king of Holland around the same time, and Louis really tried to, you know, take on the Dutch ways, protect Dutch interests. Jerome seems to take a different tack. Yeah, I think Jerome is, is pretty ineffectual as a king. Um, he is still in his early 20s when he becomes king. He's suddenly offered these big trappings of wealth and power, and he once again kind of treats himself like a celebrity. He spends a huge amount of money. He does almost no work. He loves the court and the trappings of power and the, the bowing and the scraping, but he doesn't like to, to act as a monarch. On the other hand, he does leave the running of the country to French administrators who actually run the country pretty efficiently uh, and cause Napoleon maybe fewer problems than either Louis or Joseph do. So in that regard, you know, he, he's quite good as a king because he, he doesn't try to interfere too much. Um, right. um, there are fiscal reforms, there are governance reforms, and he does get praise for them, but actually he has very little to do with them. And as time goes on, his lavish spending on the court especially starts to bankrupt the kingdom. It's not helped by the fact that he has to pay for French garrison troops as well. Um, but by 1812, his, his country is pretty much on the brink of bankruptcy. Um, he spends as much on his court as Napoleon does on the French court. Um, and, and given the, the respective size of the countries, that's absolutely ridiculous. Um, but there's also some evidence that Jerome assumed that, like with Joseph, he would be promoted to a richer and better country than Westphalia at some point. You know, Joseph had been moved from Naples to Spain. Mm -hmm. So Jerome thinks that, well, he'll get moved from Westphalia maybe to Italy or maybe to somewhere else uh, a little wealthier. So therefore, he doesn't seem overly concerned that he's bankrupting this country, Westphalia, where he doesn't plan to be for that long. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Like, uh, And there were, I mean... Um... Portugal, I know uh, Marshal Soult wanted to be king of that country. It's it's interesting how many opportunities and potential kingdoms there were for Napoleon's family. So I, I could see that. I could see him eye, eyeing his eyes on a bigger prize. Yeah, you know, there's, there's Portugal on offer. Poland is going. Uh, you know, Russia's about to be invaded. There might be bits of that to be added on. Uh, there's a lot. That, this is a, a continent of possibility under Napoleon. And I think Jerome has his eye on on bigger prizes. Well, in 1812, Napoleon invades Russia and gives Jerome control of a corps in the Grand Armée. How does Jerome do in this role? In my view, he's appalling. Um, <laughs> I, I know there are some people that say he, he did quite well in 1806. Uh, he performs competently then. Um, but as a military commander, it, it's just not his forte. He's not a, a general by either training or temperament. He doesn't seem to have the faintest understanding of the principles of Napoleonic warfare. Mm -hmm. and, and looking at Napoleon's correspondence with him during this campaign, Napoleon's of that opinion as well. Um, now, we, we can't take that always at face value because Napoleon berates everyone. But he clearly realizes that Jerome's out of his depth. Now, Jerome's actually given command of, of the whole right wing of the French army. It's three army corps. Um, the uh, the Westphalians, the Saxons, and the, the Poles. Um, but he leaves the day-to-day -day running of this command pretty much unsurprisingly to his, his chief of staff and to his generals. He doesn't really bother himself with the details. What he does do is insist on taking all the luxuries of his court with him, 
so <laughs> he becomes very slow moving. He doesn't like slumming it. He doesn't want the hardship of campaigning. He wants to to basically build a mini palace of tents uh, on on the Russian steppe. Um, and none of this is conducive to, to useful campaigning. Um, he proves very touchy and he falls out with people. And surprisingly, he's very, very jealous of his own dignity. He doesn't like mm-hmm. anyone questioning or insulting him. Uh, and when General Van Damme, who's his chief of staff, tries to get him to show a bit more energy and starts to question his orders, Jerome simply sacks him. And, and Van Damme is a good commander. You know, he's, um, I can see why people fall out with Van Damme. Uh, mm-hmm. he, he has a, a certain personality, but uh, he's a man that would have done well to run that corps on Jerome's behalf, uh, and Jerome simply gets rid of him. Um, he also falls out with Panutowski, who's under his command, and naturally he falls out with Davout, who falls out with everyone anyway. Um, but Jerome doesn't get on well with people. He doesn't lead his men particularly well, uh, and he doesn't pay much attention. Um, he is actually meant to be part of an encirclement of Bagration's army, uh, and this utterly fails because he, he doesn't get his three army corps into position in time. Mm-hmm. Um, in fairness to him, Napoleon's orders don't always arrive in good time. The roads are notoriously awful. Provisions are scarce. And a lot of this is down to poor planning on the part of Napoleon and his staff, and not just Jerome. But Jerome's lack of energy and drive really is fatal for this maneuver. Um, to make things worse, Napoleon, realizing Jerome's failings, puts Davu in overall command of this maneuver, but doesn't bother to tell Jerome. And yeah. so Jerome starts to refuse to obey Davout's orders. And then when he finally realizes he's been superseded, he simply storms off home in a fit of pique, taking his guards with him, leaving his, his corps to, to fend for themselves. Um, and yeah, this is pretty tactless from Napoleon, especially as Jerome and Davout heartily disliked each other. But it also does show Jerome's pettiness and his constant belief that his dignity is being attacked. Yeah, and then the ranking of Napoleon's court, it was Napoleon and his wife, then the princes like Jerome, and then the marshals. So for him to be put under Marshal de Vaux was probably quite insulting. Yeah, and especially as he is a king as well. Uh, you know, he's a French prince, but he sees himself as king of Westphalia. True. Um, like Mura is a king, and, you know, Mura is not put under anyone's orders. Um, Jerome thinks the same should apply to him. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it is tactless from Napoleon, but on the other hand, he should never have appointed Jerome as, as a commander anyway. I agree. Well, um, <laughs> Jerome does go back to his kingdom, but he loses it pretty soon in 1813 as the Allies overrun Westphalia. He flees to Paris and stays there until Napoleon's abdication in 1814. But this isn't the last time we see the Bonaparte brothers on the battlefield, is it? Indeed not. Um, Jerome actually does take the field briefly in 1813, but it doesn't amount to much. Um, And he has relatively little role in Napoleon's first fall. But perhaps surprisingly, he does rally to Napoleon again in 1815. And he actually offers to serve in whatever capacity Napoleon might find useful. Uh, So Napoleon appoints him to command a division. And I I find this quite interesting in 1815 because Jerome, this man who is is very touchy, um, only three years before had fallen out with everyone over them not respecting him enough. He now agrees to command an ordinary infantry division under the command of General Ray um, as a relatively junior general in the Armée du Nord. Um, Even with corps commanders in short supply, he's not considered for one of those posts, but he still serves. So maybe now, you know, he's he's over, he's just over 30 years old. He's maybe a bit more mature. Maybe he, he's seeing this as a, a route to a second career. Um, but nonetheless, he serves in the subordinate capacity, um, which I think shows shows a degree of loyalty to his brother at this stage. Um, and he does serve on the campaign and he does fight, of course, at Waterloo, albeit, uh, has to be said, not particularly successfully. <laughs> Yeah, let's talk about the Hougamont farmhouse and the attack there. I've read that it was supposed to be a diversionary tactic to get Wellington to send reserves over there. But it seems like it kind of degenerated into like an all out assault that Jerome wouldn't say no to. Like he just kept pouring men into it. Is that correct? Yeah, it's a, an interesting one because the, the Hougamont incident doesn't feature in Napoleon's initial orders for the battle. Um, So it's not quite clear whether it is simply an attempt to clear out Hougamont and give Napoleon more tactical options or whether it's a diversion. Um, But either way, Jerome sends in one brigade first that fails, takes the woodland eventually, but fails to take the farmhouse. So he commits another brigade. And then 
having basically run out of his own men, he gets Rai to start committing parts of other divisions of his of the corps uh, to this this fight around the farmhouse. Um, and Ugamon basically starts to drain away the only other frontline corps that Napoleon has available to him, which means that Second Corps can't support First Corps in their advance properly. It means that later there's no infantry available to exploit the breakthrough at La Haisante uh, and to exploit the, the um, cavalry charges. Uh, and so by Jerome kind of sucking in three or four brigades worth of troops to this fight around Hougoumont, which really doesn't lead to anything, he does cost Napoleon some reserves. My only thing that I would say to defend Jerome on this is that Jerome is doing this about 600 yards from where Napoleon's standing. Um, the idea that Napoleon couldn't simply intervene and say, can you stop doing that, please withdraw your troops and reform, uh, is a bit a bit ludicrous. So um, Jerome is allowed to get away with this. And I think blaming him, you know, he, he, he does things that are blameworthy, but had Napoleon desperately wanted those troops back, he could have withdrawn them. Right. That's a good point. Well, we all know what happens at Waterloo. Uh, Napoleon loses and has to advocate yet again. And basically the entire Bonaparte family, including Jerome, has to flee France once the Bourbons return. What are Jerome's later years like? Yeah, so as you say, he has to flee France. Um, his, he, he and his wife are actually put under house arrest. Um after Napoleon's beaten because they don't manage to get out of France in time, but they're then released and go into exile abroad. Um, Jerome is, of course, married to the King of Württemberg's daughter, um, and so he's given a, a princely title, but they go and live abroad in, in Italy and then in Switzerland. Um, his wife dies in 1835. In 1840, he marries again to a, a, a widow, um, and he lives pretty much a quiet life in exile. Um, he's got a degree of wealth. He has connections. He has his title of prince, uh, and he lives quietly until about 1848, when, of course, his nephew becomes the first, or firstly becomes president of France, uh, and then launches his coup three years later and becomes Napoleon III. And at this stage, he's given all the honours that are due to an imperial uncle. Um, now, he's made governor of the Invalide as a, a first step, and, and then he's made marshal of France, uh, and yeah. he's seen as the, the great older statesman, maybe, of the Bonaparte clan. Yeah, I find it interesting. Uh, two things. One, that he's made Marshal of France. And two, I believe he's the only one of the Bonaparte brothers that was photographed. Yes. Yeah, he's uh, the one that survives long enough to, to have a photograph taken. Uh, it's like yeah. seeing a photograph of the Duke of Wellington. It just, it seems odd. There shouldn't be a photograph of these people, but there are. Yeah, yeah. No, it's great that, that there are. Uh, Drum dies in 1860. Uh, his legacy is mixed at best. Most consider him the most unsuccessful of Napoleon's brothers. What's your take on him? I have to confess, I'm not a fan of, of Jerome. I think he's he's fairly useless. Uh, he seems to be a spoilt child who becomes a spoiled adult. He seems very touchy. He doesn't seem willing to do much hard work. Uh, he seems to assume that the world owes him a living. On the other hand, uh, you know, he's a, a, a man who had a, a very disrupted childhood, uh, you know, a lot of uncertainty until the age of 10 and then sudden wealth and, and a degree of celebrity that will have shaped him. I don't think he was a particularly good king. I don't think he was a particularly good general. Uh, it's possible he seemed to recognize that as well, though, because you know, he did accept the, the more subordinate roles in 1815. Um, so I, I am quite harsh on Jerome, uh, admittedly. I'm sure he had some redeeming features. It's just I, I can't quite find them. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good take. That's pretty much what I had as well. So uh, I appreciate uh, the biography on Jerome. And uh, again, if you'd like to learn more about Graham, uh, his books are on Amazon. And he has a new uh, Waterloo book coming out uh, summer 2024. So please check that out. And Graham, we thank you as always. Thanks very much for having me.